Do they still make those? Is it us? Can we tow it? Park it? Live in it? Where would we sleep? Where would we go? Can we do this? Stop wondering. Start wandering. Airstream, take the first step today. She's the archivist and historian for Airstream Corporation, and she is give, speaking today on the 50th anniversary of NASA's mobile quarantine, faci quarantine facility. Thank you very much, Samantha. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you. All right, so is this going to be okay volume-wise? All right, I might start to fade out, so... <laughs> Let me know if, you know, I start to drift off, you can't hear me, okay? So, as she said, my name is Samantha Martin, and I am the archivist and historian for Airstream. And yes, it is the dream job. So, when I got to thinking about what I wanted to present on for Doswell, I thought with the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 lunar landing, that Airstream's involvement with that historic mission and the mobile quarantine facility would be the perfect topic. So, that's what we're really going to dive into today. And tell you about how that happened and then what happened and kind of where they are now all right all right so during the 1960s as NASA was preparing to send astronauts to the moon there was this uh, sort of developing concern about the threat of unknown lunar pathogens the fear was that you know potentially astronauts could encounter some sort of bacteria on the moon and then bring it back to Earth and expose everyone else, leading to an outbreak of some sort of moon disease. Uh, it sounds kind of crazy, but you know, it's the unknown. And so uh, the threat wasn't considered all that great, but it was enough to take precaution. Um, and so out of that, there was an agency developed called the Interagency Committee on Back Contamination, or thankfully the ICBC for short. Uh, um, and that was a group of various individuals from um, the National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Public Health Service, USDA, and the U.S. Department of Interior. And they served sort of as an advisory board for NASA because ultimately it would be NASA's responsibility to sort of find the safest way to contain this threat. And so their main goals were to protect public health, agriculture and other terrestrial resources and then the other benefit of this uh, sort of contamination was that it would it protect the integrity of the lunar samples that were being brought back. <laughs> mainly three phases of quarantine. You had uh, in-flight procedures that would help with the overall contamination. You had recovery and transport procedures. And then you had the creation of the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But through all of those phases, the main goal was still biological containment um, and assessment of the crew, samples, and any other lunar exposed material for a minimum of 21 days. The thought was that, you know, sort of the most threatening diseases on Earth at the time could be detected within 21 days. So if we quarantine anything and everyone for that time period, we'll notice if anything starts to develop and we can go from there. Um, there were some issues. I mean, this is a, a very a tricky thing to sort of pull off. And so some of those were that, you know, you had these multiple groups, multidisciplinary and sort of almost contradictory goals. You have NASA who wants to get there, get everyone back safely and get the samples back safely. And so, you know, it's hard to, to kind of convince them to do these other containment steps that aren't, aren't always easy. Um, it also relied a lot on assumptions. Like I've mentioned a couple times already, they were basing it on the most deadly earthly diseases because it was really just the unknown. So you're doing your best to protect from an unknown enemy, basically. Um, but ultimately it was decided that this risk was not great enough to justify an otherwise avoidable injury or loss of life. Um, so essentially, you know, if they were to splash down and the command module was to start sinking, they would be evacuated and quarantine would be broken. The risk was not great enough to, you know, to go to that extreme. The same thing if um, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory or the MQF was to catch fire, the crew would be evacuated. So that's kind of, it shows you where they were at in considering the threat. <laughs> 
So, looking at the phases, we'll kind of dive into how they started to do this. Um, phase one, like I mentioned, was equipment in the spacecraft. They used vacuum brushes to kind of take up any extra lunar dust. They had uh, special containers for the materials that they brought back and a ventilated filter on the command module so that when it splashed down, the air coming out of that wasn't releasing contaminants into the ocean. Um, when the uh, astronauts landed, they were given these um, big suits or biological isolation garments. They were sort of thrown in and then the hatch was shut. Um, and so these were like a nylon fabric that contains the microorganisms um, and then they wore a respirator and we'll talk later but these were not really popular with the crew um, they were <laughs> super cumbersome they made you really hot uh, to the point where when they landed their masks started to steam up and the helicopter wasn't even sure who they were picking up first you couldn't see them so they, uh, lots of complaints about those isolation garments in particular uh, phase two is of course where airstream is going to come into the picture uh, was the decision that there needed to be a mobile quarantine facility or mqf there had to be some way to transport up to six people for up to 10 days from the splashdown site to the ultimate lunar receiving laboratory and then this lunar receiving laboratory was uh, a really elaborate quarantine facility at the Johnson Space Center um, with all sorts of systems for further isolation and evaluation um, and the nice thing is that the lab also um, allowed for the time sensitive uh, research and investigation into the samples so it's here that you know they were uh, incinerating the air that had been contaminated. Um, they had a vacuum chamber for studying the lunar samples and they were trying to replicate the lunar environment um, so that those samples wouldn't be compromised in any way. And the majority of the quarantine would take place at the lab. Um, but this I think is really helpful to show these. So you have your spacecraft operations, your landing and recovery operations where they splash down, they're retrieved in the helicopter, they're put in the mobile quarantine, and then the mobile quarantine is transferred into the LRL. So I like that, that graphic, I think that's really helpful. And then eventually, if there aren't any b moon germs, they get to be released, so. <laughs> So as they're looking into what needs to happen for this mobile quarantine facility, these are sort of the specs, the minimum requirements, so to speak. As I mentioned, six people for up to 10 days. Um, and it was kind of determined, you know, from the very beginning, why don't we just use a house trailer? You know, something that already has some of these features. So that's what they were looking at. It needed to have self-contained power. And the tricky part was is it also needed to be able to interface with the electrical systems of the aircraft carrier, um, the cargo ship, and the transport vehicle. So it's got multiple power systems that it needs to interact with. Um, and because of that, it wouldn't have wheels. It would be built on a metal pallet and it would be able to withstand a uh, crane lift. My opening image there, you can see it being lifted pretty high into the sky, so it needed to have that stability. And then for the actual biological containment aspect, it needed to have a negative internal pressure, which was accomplished through a series of exhaust fans that were filtered, and nothing larger than a .5 micron, which is a thousandth of a millimeter, could leave the inside of the MQF. So the, the tolerances there were pretty, pretty tight. Um, it had to have communication capabilities. The people inside needed to be able to talk to the people outside. And of course, the astronauts had to be able to speak with the press. So that was a requirement there. And then uh, they wanted a pass through for the lunar samples. Essentially, you know, they didn't want to wait the entire time in the mobile quarantine to get those out and start studying them. They wanted the, that to happen right away. So they had to figure out how can we keep it contained but get those items out. And we'll talk about how that happens in a bit. So ultimately, NASA gets several bids for the construction of this MQF mobile quarantine facility. Um, but Melpar Incorporated out of Falls Church, Virginia, wins the bid. They were a subsidiary at the time of Westinghouse. Throughout the process, they would become a subsidiary of American Standard. And they subcontracted with Airstream to build the basic vehicular structure of all four MQFs. And the rest is history. So. 
Airstream in Melpar's vision kind of seemed like the natural choice. Um, due to the aircraft-like construction, you know, it was strong, it was rigid, and importantly, it was lightweight because it had various vehicles that it needed to be transported on. And the pre-existing features would provide self-containment and comfort for the astronauts and crew. So um, Melpar contacted the president of Airstream at the time, Art Costello, um, and they took it on and then uh, they were ultimately built in the Jackson Center, Ohio facility. I thought these are pretty neat. I don't know if you can see them super well. I can try to... There. Zoom in a little bit, make them a little less fuzzy. I don't think that's doing much. But <laughs> yeah, so these are uh, just two press releases that I pulled because I thought they kind of showed the excitement of both companies. Airstream is on the left here, and Melpar, or American Standard, is on the right. Um, and so Airstream to build mobile quarantine structures for lunar astronauts, um, American Standard mobile quarantine unit, uh, home for returning Apollo 11 crew. These are the messages that these companies were excited to be doing this and that we're going out into the world. So as I mentioned, four of them were built in Jackson Center, Ohio from about 67 to 68. Uh, they were essentially a modified 30 foot long travel trailer which resembled our 30 foot international model at the time. It came in, in the end, under 10,000 pounds with the equipment, the supplies, and the crew, which is exciting because it was under half the required weight that NASA had recommended. So, <laughs> yes, the, it did have some of your typical Airstream features at the time. It had a lounge, a galley, sleeping and toilet areas. It had a toilet, a sink, a bathtub, a water heater, um, closets for their NASA jumpsuits, reading lights so that they could keep themselves entertained under quarantine, its own water supply, AC units, and waste tank, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then the first one also had carpet. They did testing of the first unit. They were worried that it would be a fire risk, and so the other three had linoleum. Some of the unique features, um, it had bunks, for the beds and then rigidly mounted sort of airplane style seats that both of them had safety belts. Theoretically, you know, when you're being lifted from one transport vehicle to another, you want to be strapped in there, especially if you're on your bunk bed, you don't want to go rolling out. Uh, the metal chassis, the chassis was mounted to that metal pallet. It had a rear door, which we'll see plenty of pictures of later, so that they could enter in a nice picture window, which is where you get that iconic image with President Nixon, and an emergency exit. It had a submersible, submersible decontamination transfer lock. That was the solution to the problem I mentioned earlier of the pass-through of materials. So they took the lunar samples, put them into specialized containers, put them into this transfer lock system, which was then flooded with a decontamination agent, and then they opened it on the other side, got the samples out. Uh, once they got those samples out, they took them in two different transport methods in case there was a failure. Um, and then those were delivered pretty rapidly to the lunar receiving laboratory. Interestingly enough, though, that lock worked both ways, and they had a special, at the time, unique microwave meals for the crew um, that were packaged. They'd come in, be flooded, and then go in the other side, and uh, they were able to eat with their newfangled microwave. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Negative internal pressure was ultimately created by those exhaust fans and then the exterior had the sealed rivets. All waste, including gray water um, and black water, was captured in special containers, which were quarantined and then later chemically treated. In place of the typical credenza table, you had your medical examination table. You had communication capabilities, a two-way phone, TV reception, and a PA system. There was a control panel uh, managed by a recovery engineer with alarms that helped monitor the environment and the power systems. And that, this sort of redundant power system and these fans were really important because um, they had diesel genera generator batteries and backup oxygen because one of the biggest concerns about the MQF is that when it was put into the aircraft, um, if that was to lose pressurization, um, that could become a very dangerous uh, 
very dangerous um, situation very quickly. And so there were blowout panels on the uh, outer shell to mitigate that risk of this uh, decompression. Um, and then there was a plastic tunnel, you'll see in some of the photos later, that connected securely the mobile quarantine facility to the command module. And it was that system that allowed the recovery engineer to go into the command module and get those uh, lunar samples. Um, and, not to be morbid, but there were four body bags aboard. There were five people in there. <laughs> in four body bags and uh, I've heard it said that that's because unfortunately the last guy couldn't zip himself up. So it does bring you back to the reality of the situation, you know. <laughs> the, the threat was minimal but still, I mean this is scary stuff that, that they were dealing with. Um, and the recovery engineer and the uh, medical doctor in the MQF with the crew did volunteer for this job so that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, Here's uh, some of the drawings. We've got the, the roof on the top part there with the air conditioner units, the filters, um, and the exhaust vents. Then you've got in here, you can see you've got your laboratory, your bunks, your kitchen area, um, and then your seating's up front. So, I mean, it looks like a travel trailer, right? <laughs> And I thought these would be neat to share with you guys that are in our archives. Um, this is sort of the construction series of photos, which are really cool. Um, you can see the chassis being built on the left top there. The middle is that metal pallet that allowed it to interface with the other systems. You can see the aluminum being put on the shell in a couple of those shots. They're inspecting, this is one of my favorite photos there in the bottom middle, they're inspecting that rear door that they would enter through. And then we're getting into January of 68. You know, they've got interior walls, they've got the carpet laid out starting to really take shape. Um, I love these shots as well. You've got some of the Airstream crew there uh, working on the, the wiring and then working on the exterior shell and you know everybody was really excited to be a part of this of this project and there's a lot of pride and when they land and you can see that broadcast on TV it was really neat to see them enter something that, that had been built in Jackson Center so that's yeah, a really cool aspect of it. There's that newfangled microwave we were talking about. Uh, <laughs> and then that gives you an idea. That is a really nice color photo of the control panel and all the alarms and the oxygen and the power systems that, that went with that. So There's a nice shot of the bunks and you can see the belts that strap them in. The control panel again with one of those uh, upright seats and then there is the row of those seats for them that again they had the, the belts for. So. So MQF-001 began in November of 67 and finished in February of 68. From that point it was then taken out for testing. Uh, they did a dry run of basically everything. They splashed down, they swam to a command module, they put people in the MQF, they put it from ship to plane, all that fun stuff, making sure that all the power systems worked. Um, they did do a simula simulation of the depressurization um, to make sure that everybody would be okay through that. Uh, one of the things that came out of um, of this testing was the microwave meals that they had planned were a little bit too spicy for all this movement and close quarters so that was kind of <laughs> that's one of the things you know you live and learn that they adjusted um, and then I mentioned earlier they removed the carpet and uh, they also coated the interior with fire retardant materials the big material after the Apollo 1 fire. Um, fire was something that they were really taking seriously and so there were some extra steps uh, added on to that. And then once that was all settled, the, th the remaining three were built in May of 68. So this, uh, these are some great photos of that test mission. Um, that's recovery engineer John Hirasaki with the control panel and he would be the control, uh, the recovery engineer for Apollo 11 as well. That's some people peering in at them while they're on their test mission. I love that photo and then that's the, the test crew and the bunks there. So. <laughs> so, Apollo 11, uh, they land on July 20th, 19th, July and 50 years tomorrow, they splash down in the Pacific Ocean.
And so this, I'll give you just kind of a run through of what happens from that point on. So the command module lands in the Pacific Ocean and it gets its flotation collar uh, installed by swimmers. And then as I mentioned, an additional swimmer comes in on a raft throws them their big suits, their isolation garments, closes the hatch really quickly, sanitizes that down. They put on their suits and then they're retrieved via helicopter. Um, the flight surgeon is in the helicopter waiting for them. Both he and the recovery engineer had been quarantined eight days before so that they couldn't uh, contract uh, any diseases. Um, so they had been in there for a while. They had already been in there for eight days. Uh, and they were kind of fed information about how the mission was going while they were in there. Uh, the swimmer then decontaminates the command module and himself and then all that decontamination gear is sunk uh, and the command module is towed to the deck of the USS Hornet which is where the mobile quarantine facility is as well. So and that's a nice shot uh, the command module, the plastic tunnel, and then the uh, MQF there, and how that system worked. So the crew and the flight surgeon land on the deck of the USS Hornet and they enter the MQF in front of a crowd of press and dignitaries. Um, the steps and deck are then sanitized and President Nixon comes out. He walks to the front of the MQF and addresses the, or the rear, sorry, of the MQF and addresses the men through a, a window. And that broadcast was watched by about 500 million people worldwide which is really incredible. Um, and had quarantine been broken aboard the USS Hornet at any point, had anything gone wrong, um, President Nixon would have been immediately evacuated and the ship, the entire ship with its crew, would have stayed at sea for the entire 21 days of quarantine. But thankfully that didn't happen. Uh, and so the primary recovery engineer here, Saki, goes into the command module, gets all those samples out, uh, and shuts down the command module. Interestingly enough, he notes uh, that he had done this for several other missions that hadn't gone to the lunar surface, obviously, uh, and that there was a distinct scent aboard the command module uh, that he assumed was the scent of the moon that smelled like black powder uh, or kind of like flint striking seal, uh, steel, sorry, which is really interesting that that's kind of the, the lunar scent there. Um, then the samples were prepared and passed through that transfer lock. After the crowd left, the USS Hornet continued to uh, Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii where uh, the MQF was host hoisted onto a truck and driven to a, a waiting C-141. During that drive, they're greeted by crowds, including the family of uh, Armstrong and Collins um, and Aldrin. And I've got a great shot you'll see later of their wives waving to them through the window. It was Hawaii, so they're all wearing lays and they put lay on the door handle of the MQF, which I think is really neat. Uh, the C-141 then has the MQF inside and they go to Ellington Air Force Base in Houston where it is taken to the Johnson Space Center and securely attached to the, that's missing there, but to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. So they made it. Um, they, in total, spent uh, 88 hours or three and a half days in the mobile quarantine facility where they went through medical exams, debriefing, and in general had a chance to just eat, sleep, and relax, which they talk about, you know, as something that they, they kind of enjoyed. Um, overall, the quarantine was successful. They didn't, they didn't find any lunar pathogens. Um, a couple of people in the lunar receiving laboratory had issues with their vacuum chamber gloves and were added into the quarantine. But other than that, it went without incident. Um, and at the end of the, the 21 days, they were released and went on their kind of press circuit around the world to talk about what they had done. So, it's a nice interior drawing there. You've got that medical examination table and that shot up front in the bunks, the galley, and the bathroom area. That's the iconic photo of Nixon with the Apollo 11 crew talking to them aboard USS Hornet. And uh, something that we at Airstream have uh, been working on that we're really excited about for the new upcoming Heritage Center, we have recreated the end shell of a mobile quarantine facility. It's just the end there with the rear window. Uh, and so visitors to the Heritage Center can walk behind it, peer through the window, and sort of recreate their own version of this photo, which I, I think will be really neat we're uh, we're super excited about that so
Uh, here are some more shots from Apollo 11, the MQF being transported, the astronauts in their isolation garments going in, uh, waving to the crowd. I love this photo there of them sitting and reading inside the MQF. And then there's the photo I mentioned before with, with their wires sort of waving from the outside. Uh, and obviously, everybody in the in the travel trailer world was really really excited about this. So the the left there is uh, the Trailer Topics magazine article, and then you might recognize the one on the right. That's a WBCCI caravanner, because the uh, Apollo 11 crew was awarded honorary memberships in the club, uh, <laughs> which is. And the article talks about you know they didn't have airstreams, but they think after everything they've been through that they they deserved this honor. So I thought that was really neat. Uh, the club presidents at the time wrote a really nice letter to them offering that and then Art Costello, president of Airstream, offered to let the astronauts have Airstreams for their families to travel whenever they wanted, which is really neat. So, You know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I can't find any evidence if they did. <laughs> but then, uh, so that was the first MQF used. Apollo 12 also used an MQF, and that was essentially the same procedures that we went through. Yeah. Of the four Airstream built, which was the one used for Apollo 11? We'll get there. Okay. We'll get it. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, so. Apollo 12, like I said, it was essentially the same process, except the backup recovery crew that was on the outside of the MQF helping the engineer and the surgeon became the interior primary backup crew for this mission. Uh, they spent 89 hours in the MQF, and interestingly enough, that included Thanksgiving, and they were able to have a turkey dinner while in there, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, they lucked out, they, because there were no lunar pathogens determined on a, Apollo 11, they were able to replace those big suits um, with lightweight coveralls and respirators, which you can see there. So that was a, a step towards a little less strict of a quarantine. Um, we've got the Apollo 12 crew in there aboard the USS Hornet. You can see the Hornet put a sign on there that says three more like before, which is pretty neat. Um, and then there they are talking to, to family members outside of the window as well through the phone, which I, I just love those shots. And then the uh, uh, Apollo 13, obviously, due to the onboard explosion, did not use the mobile not use the facility that was intended for that mission. And we'll talk about its sort of interesting history after that point later, but Apollo 14 did use an MQF. In fact, it used two MQFs and two recovery helicopters. Again, since 11 and 12 didn't show any real risk, they decided to uh, basically shorten the process by taking them helicopter to MQF and then helicopter to MQF. Um, and they, again, did not have to wear the, the big suits. So there they are inside their MQF, and that would be the last time, the last of the four, that was used because no signs of lunar pathogens had been detected and the quarantine procedure was ultimately ended after that point. Um, the same sort of procedures were used, of course, to protect the integrity of the lunar samples, uh, but the actual quarantine of, of the crew was discontinued. So I thought these are really neat perspectives. Um, Neil Armstrong wrote, the quarantine process, rather than a nuisance, provided us the opportunity to do the work that needed to be done. In view of the intense public interest in the flight, that would have been very difficult without the quarantine requirement. And I just love this photo. It's a little hard to see, but that's him inside the MQF playing a ukulele, which I think is really neat. Uh, and then Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell said, for three astronauts who had just spent eight days weightlessly bumping around each other in the Apollo command module with no privacy nor gravity for eating, sleeping, or personal hygiene activities, it seemed like a palace. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that's, that's very true. <laughs> um, and I included some more shots of the MQS sort of on their transport adventure there. And so this gets to uh, where are they today? So interestingly enough, it was uh, 003 that was used for Apollo 11. Uh, and that is at the uh, Smithsonian Institution National Air and Space, their branch um, right outside of the Dulles Airport. I think some of you might have been able to, to go to the 
highly recommend it. It's really surreal to see it in person. The display is really nice. Um, MQF-002 was the one used for Apollo 12. It's at the U.S. Space and Rocket Park in Huntsville, Alabama. It had sort of an interesting life um, after it was used for Apollo 12. Um, it was uh, used by the CDC for scientists um, in Sierra Leone who had uh, come in contact with a disease while working there. And then it was transferred uh, to, I believe it was the USGS in the state of Alabama. Um, and it was actually sitting in a field hatchery and been used by crews working there and doing some research. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go down to Marion to, uh, there's a big park uh, there, Marion, Alabama, yeah. uh, outdoor park, and I used to drive within a hundred yards of it, and I think I actually recognized it as an airstream, but I never got up close to inspect it, and one day, and it sat out there for years, years, <laughs> uh, and one day this guy got interested in it, more interested in it, and he walked over there, and the first thing he noticed, it didn't have any wheels on, and the next thing he noticed, that it was on this big steel crane for transport, and then he looked inside, and that's when it hit him like a lightning bolt. He said, oh my God, this is a piece of history. And I said, I've driven past it. That, thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. Yes, yeah, so he uh, then they ended up getting it to the, the Space and Rocket Center there um, and they restored the interior, you know, because it had an interesting life out there in that field and been used for various purposes. But it's beautifully done and on display there. Um, MQF 004, which was used for Apollo 14, is at the USS Hornet Sea and Air Museum in Alameda, California. Um, restored beautifully as well and you know it's kind of fitting to have that on the USS Hornet again on display there. Now here's where I put in sort of a plea. <laughs> MQF-001 was intended to be used during Apollo 13. It was transferred to the USDA and its location is currently unknown. There are rumors that it has been destroyed but there were rumors that, Apollo, that the one in Alabama had been destroyed too so I'm holding out hope. <laughs> If you happen to drive past a field <laughs> and, and see something, you know, that looks like an Airstream that doesn't have wheels, please call me, okay? <laughs> I would love to be able to track down the last remaining piece of MQF history, so. <laughs> All right, and with that, I leave you with what I, I think this really interesting shot of the interior of the MQF, so. That's that history of Airstream's place in space. Thank you, guys. At, at any time of your discussion of putting the Airstream logo or the Airstream name prominently on the NCAT, Actually, I'm glad you asked. So um, you can see in some of the earlier pictures when it's leaving. Yeah, oh yeah. So was there ever any discussion of using the Airstream logo? on the MQFs. And so when it's leaving the factory in Jackson Center, you can see in some of the historic photos, it has our badge right up top where, you know, where it goes. Um, but apparently, I've, I read a couple oral histories with some people involved in the project, and right before that broadcast of 500 million people, there is a panic, and that panic was that maybe they couldn't advertise. And so it's from that that the sign, the Hornet Plus 3, was very quickly, from what I've read, carved out and put on top of our logo. And actually, American Standards logo was right below the door. In an Apollo 11, that's covered with the presidential seal. And then on Apollo 12, that's covered with the USS Hornet logo. So those logos were on there until sort of a, a last minute, whoops, <laughs> and then they were covered. Uh, on our recre our, um, replica in shell, the logo is back up there. So. <laughs> The number three, which is the Apollo 11 NQF that's at the Utrahazi Museum, uh, the Hornet uh, sign is covering it on the rear door. But on the front side, it's the Airstream banner. And we released a photo to the press last night of our group of Airstreamers at that NQF holding up a banner that says, Happy 50th Anniversary NQF. Wally Byam Airstream Club with our logo, okay? And on that, and you'll see in that photo, hopefully some newspapers will run it, 
Uh, we photographed it from the side where the Airstream logo is up there on the top. And it was there. It was covered up by the Hornet uh, for the purposes she just mentioned, but it definitely was on there when that was used for Apollo 11. Thank you. That's a great, yeah. Samantha, you were talking about uh, microwaves and the use of microwaves. And we were just saying, were microwaves in common use or was, was the space program part of developing microwaves for us? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the interesting part is that the space program was really, the question was about microwaves. Um, and the space program was a, a huge part in sort of getting those out into the world. And this was the first, you know, air, and now you've got microwaves in your airstreams. And so, yeah, it's an interesting part that one of the more unique features in that MQF was this microwave, which is so commonplace today. Um, during the testing I read, um, this was the first time that an egg had been exploded in a microwave because they had to learn that lesson. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me just add to the blue part. I, in 1967, I was involved in research, but we were actually in the major I was involved in 1967 in major food company, where in fact we had a very big program on microwaving food. So it was going on inside the food industry as an idea in 1967. Any other questions? I will say, um, real quick too, before I forget, I brought this with me. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're good. <laughs> well, my question is not about the quarantine facility, yeah. but I was a little curious about the tra Airstream's use of the, um, the transport vehicle. Oh, yeah. You can see at Cape Canaveral. And sure. What, um, what flights and things that was used for. Yeah, so the question was about the um, astronaut transfer van, otherwise known as the Astro van, which um, is an 83 Airstream Accela motorhome that you can see at the Kennedy Space Center. I was gonna add that in, but I figured I'd focus on the MQF. Um, so yeah, it's a modified 83 Excella, um, and it fit the crew going from the launch pad, or, or from the Kennedy Space Center to the launch pad. That started in 84 and continued on until 2011 when that program was discontinued. It only averaged something like a thousand miles a year during that time span, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, you can see there's a really neat interview with some of the astronauts who were on that last voyage uh, with it on YouTube. And um, they talk about how they had cooled air in the 83 motorhome that would run through their suits and that was like this treat because they didn't have it anywhere else and they really had a, a fondness for the tradition of that Astro van which is, which is pretty neat so yeah it's um in the Kennedy Space Center on display uh, you can go see it I heard the display is really neat so definitely check it out yeah I was told that the prior to Neil Armstrong's crew going to the moon that uh, they went to the interior of Iceland. Parts of that is very similar conditions to the moon, so that they could kind of do some experiments. And, and uh, so that's what I was told. I was back, I was there in 2017 uh, to Iceland. Oh, really? Went through the interior. Parts of it is. That's really interesting. Yeah, you know, that's what fascinates me through all this is the, the preparation for the unknown. You're preparing for what you don't know. So I think that that's really interesting. Yeah. Do you have any data on the cost of the airstream or what we charge the we have some. Um, most of that was handled by Melpar since they won the bid. Um, so I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, unfortunately. But. I did want to say, if you are interested in really diving into this history, um, I think it's fascinating. I highly recommend. There's a book written by Bob Fish. He was an Apollo curator and um, was with the USS Hornet Museum in Alameda, California for a really long time. He actually is responsible for sort of finding the MQFs, um, where they were, and, and getting the one for, the, uh, for their museum restored. He wrote a book called Hornet Plus Three and it really dives into the, re the recovery of these missions. So I, I think it's, it's definitely worth a read. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you. I appreciate it.
The Airstream Nation shines from sea to shining sea. And at Airstream of Chicago, we aim to help you explore all of it. As a five rivet certified dealership with the largest showroom in the Midwest, we aim to provide you with unmatched customer service and the best buying experience in the industry. We believe everybody should enjoy an amazing RV experience, just as Airstream founder Wally Byam did when he designed the Airstream almost a century ago. A travel trailer is built to travel primarily, and its main thing is to get places and go places and see things. A good travel trailer has to be built much more sturdily, and it's built very much like an airplane. It's aluminum and riveted and lightweight and strong, and it's built for the highway. Conveniently located just outside Chicago at the crossroads of America means we are here to serve your RV buying and rental needs, whether you're heading north, south, east, or west. Check us out at airstreamofchicago.com.